Thank you, uh, Mr. Rubin, for your uh, very generous and uh, very detailed introduction of my some achievements. Thank you. I I extend my sincere thanks to uh, Professor Vishmi and uh, uh, the University Mahatma Gandhi the University, and uh, also I greet all the party participants who are present today and attending this uh, workshop. And uh, I have been asked to discuss or speak on legal research. And uh, in the valedictory address, speaking on a technical subject is uh, actually difficult. However, I'm inclined to uh, share some of the ideas with regard to this particular uh, issue. So to begin with, I have to say that the status of Indian uh, legal research, especially the empirical legal research in India, uh, has not really taken off. And to uh, the state of research, if you look at the active contributors to legal research in India are the research institutions and not the universities. That is something very important and interesting. And why we have a sort of a low profile status to the value of uh, legal research in our country. I think this is the moot question before we can take up other question. So first of all, if we see in the overall structure of legal education, the emphasis on the subject of legal research itself is very limited. If you see the five year or three year uh, you know, curriculum of undergraduate law, BLLB or LLB, you will not find much in terms of uh, providing systematic introduction to the different techniques of legal research to the students. And also at even LLM level, though we have introduced a paper on or paper on uh, legal research methods, in most cases, as my experience goes, this paper is also not a great priority. And when I probe a little deeper into this state of affairs, the first and foremost thing that occurred to me and that I have noticed is the fact that you do not have trained teachers to teach uh, legal research in most uh, state universities, especially. And since the teachers are lacking uh, a systematic orientation into the nitty gritty of uh, methods of legal research, they are unable to actually deploy the required degree of training and orientation to these students in general. Therefore, we are into a very vicious circle and the capacities are not being built up as far as legal research is concerned. And Lately, however, I noted with some satisfaction that because of the initiatives of a couple of institutions here and there, we could at least see empirical legal research coming up and some reports are being published, which are now being utilized uh, by the law teachers and law students extensively. Now, point number two is very interesting. When I, when I look at the growth our origin of uh, legal research in our country. I find that we can be placed at three levels as far as our understanding, our uses of legal research is concerned. The first level is essentially the level of learners. So we can be the learners of uh, legal research. And uh, second level is we are the doers of legal research. So we are doing research because we have to do research. This is uh, the requirement for at least uh, LLM dissertation or PhD in law. So they are essentially the doers. And third level is very rare, but it is important. They are the critics. Critics are those who are capable of deploying critical insights into the understanding of legal research by way of evaluating the works done by others. And that actually gives a lot of 
you know, promotional value to the whole idea of legal research. Now, I notice another thing which is very important, and that is there are certain trends which are now emerging, as I said, because we are in 20, 21st century where the techniques of law teaching have really changed. And there is a lot of scope and deployment of digital tools, quantitative methods, software applications. And because of all these technologies, young scholars are at least encouraged to utilize certain techniques and methods in evaluating their contents, the legal law subject contents. And that has actually given rise to the you know, uh, legal research. Now, essentially, the growth of legal research is linked with the fact that with the manner in the manner how we teach uh, in our law schools. I noticed that we are actually teaching a very normative black letter kind of law in our classes. And therefore, why of the law is something which not many times we see being discussed in the classroom. Resultantly, we are not promoting relevant inquiries which could promote investigations and empirical you know, research. Question is that there can be two models in which law teaching happens and which has something to do with your capacity to undertake legal research. So one model is very simple where we are, where we teach rhetoric of the law. The rhetoric of the law means we are teaching plain teaching of uh, any law. Now there is an emergence of a second model of law teaching, which has actually given a lot of, uh, you know, uh, encouragement to the legal research. And that model is called the reality of the law. Reality of the law based contextual teaching of law means we are more interested to look at law interacting with various factors outside of the purview of law located in the society. And it is in this kind of uh, teaching of law, you require the collection of quantitative data, collection of information in a systematic way to understand the social realities impacting the discourses in the field of law. I also say that we are in an era where we are more and more trying to look at the application part of law. If you are studying application or if you are trying to understand the impact, you require the deployment of empirical legal research techniques. I wish to draw your attention to the fact that, for instance, you want to know at a particular point of time as to how effectively a legal provision is actually functioning or what has been the impact of a Supreme Court decisions on the intended stakeholders. You know, these kinds of inquiries are essentially to be followed with the help of empirical methods. You cannot really assess the impact of a law theoretically. You need to actually design an impact research model to collect empirical data from different stakeholders. Now, many a times, many law teachers are, for that matter, students do ask this question that how come empirical research is possible in traditional subjects like criminal law, constitutional law, or environmental law? I try to actually answer this question in inviting their attention as to what are the institutions of law. Who are the stakeholders of law? If you are able to locate the stakeholders and institutions in law, you are actually in a position to identify 
the sources of data that you can gather. So, for instance, I want to understand the impact of Section 41A in the Indian Penal Code where, relating to the law of arrest. I mean, how effectively or how often a police station in charge uses this particular provision in effect. Now, this inquiry will take me to those police stations where police officers are registering the cases and try to invoke section 41A. Now, I can collect a variety of data of this process to be able to actually state or convey the manner in, this, in which this particular law is being implemented are the required critical areas which are noticed in the implementation of this law. So this one example can be utilized in, in so many ways to understand as to how the impact of law or the operation of law happens. I wish to draw your attention if I say you need to understand the operation of a particular law, you have to essentially undertake an empirical model based research study in which you would draw certain hypotheses or you would collect uh, some uh, you know quantitative data from the stakeholders of law and then you can deploy some advanced statistical and quantitative technique in analyzing that data with reference to the objective of your research all this process would provide you some insights in terms of knowing the you know underlying facts which are not otherwise discoverable so most of the time empirical legal research is all about quantification or operationalization quantification and operationalization means in the field of law you have a variety of subjects and those variety of subjects are taught at different levels now, we do not draw any meaning in terms of measurability because research is all about measurement. I raise this question to all the participants. How often can you see the different concepts in law being measurable? So like for instance, justice, rule of law. All these things we use so often, fairness. But if I ask you how to measure fairness or how to measure rule of law, many of us would find it difficult. So in other words, we have not taken up this concept to the level of operationalization, which is called measurement. And su some of such developments are actually happening now if you are aware of, I can give you two examples. One example is World Justice Project is now producing a host of data with regard to the measurement of rule of law index as well as justice index. So they have been able to measure justice as well as rule of law with the help of nine indicators. Now these nine indicators take you to certain measurable outcomes in which you can measure. Now this is happening, however, uh, this process requires a basic capacity to do so. Now another example you must be recently seeing, happiness has been measured. So we have now World Justice Report on happiness. Happiness has been quantified. I am trying to convey a large number of concepts which are socio-legal in nature in the field of law have been, you know, put to test or put to measurement. And that process is actually not happening. That process is not happening anywhere in the law school. So if you read so many concepts in jurisprudence, if you ask what is the operational understanding of those concepts in terms of their measurability, all these queries will take you to the actual application of empirical legal research and I also say the extent to which you are interested in the whole idea of objectivity 
then legal research becomes important. Generally, the trend in legal research in this country has been, in most cases, we, we try to make use of our own impressions, conjectures, ideas, opinions. So we are speaking through our opinions. We are making opinionated statements. And we fail to distinguish between an opinion statement and a fact statement. So I think you can look back how many times you have spoken to seminar or you have spoken to classes, how many times you have fact statements with regard to a particular issue. I can say with a lot of uh, conviction that many, most of the times we are making opinion statements. They may be right, but here we are talking about legal research, which require you to use more and more fact statements. Fact statements are based on facts, information, data. Now, we do not have enough data in the legal regime to be able to actually come out with a lot of things we generally speak about. And therefore, there are lots of issues. I also say the objectivity in legal research is a crisis. And when I speak that, uh, that we are not generating enough data, what are the sources of data in the field of law? Who are generating? Are we generating any data, primary data in the field of law? We have thousands of colleges and uh, lakhs of teachers, hundred thousands of teachers. We are not generating primary data through our research on different kinds of subjects. We are repeating again and again the things which are said by one scholar. Those things are again reproduced by a third scholar, fourth scholar, and that chain continues without actually having to contribute anything new. I'm asking why are not we able to capture the data. First of all, we do not have a training to acknowledge or appreciate the sources of data or to understand where to get the data for our uh, research. I'm also saying that it is the problem of our temperament in the sense that we are scholars, teachers, or students who are more and more focused on content, content of books, content of writing, content of case laws. So we have a content-based consciousness. We do not have enough method consciousness. I can very easily provide you an example. Every time you need to look at the content of a particular writing, probably you are unable to identify the presence of a methodology in a paper. So how many times do you read the method in a particular writing? You ask this question and you will get the answer that I'm trying to actually speak upon. How often do you read method in a case of legal writing? So we are not method conscious. We are not interested in method. We are only interested in the content which is provided in a writing. That is all right. But there are disadvantage of not being a method conscious person. And those disadvantages actually result into the non-appreciation of legal research. And that is what I'm saying. We do not tend to collect enough data. We do not tend to collect, capture enough data. We do not encourage a student to collect primary data with respect to this. Because we do not have any idea how to 
get the students to the site of data collection where they can easily look at the data or the so this situation is so pathetic that the research scholars or teachers or the students who complete their legal education from the law school, we invariably find that their toolkit remains deficient. What is this toolkit deficiency is all about? I am trying to tell you that toolkit means what are the skills that you have learned as far as the application of legal research tools are concerned. So because when you go to the profession, it is a legal research or any, any profession in the law academics, you will find that you are called upon to deploy various techniques which you have not learned enough. So like for, for instance, we are not very good at data analysis. Even if I get a lot of data about the national judicial grid regarding pendency, judges, a lot of institutions these days in India are actually compiling important data. But we are somehow not making use of this data because no law school train their students to make use of the data. How to handle the existing repositories of data in different fields. And this, this deficiency or this skill, lack of a skill is very, very important. Because if you do not do this, you will not be critically evaluate. You will not be able to critically evaluate any policy. And this data is crucial because decisions which are based on the data are always very, very important. Now, another thing which I wish to say that there is not enough awareness about the evidence-based research in our law school. And this situation, if you look at or contrast this situation uh, in other jurisdiction, so like in, for instance, in the United States of America, invariably all the law schools have set up the Center for Empirical Legal Research. If I can give you an example of Cornell Law School, uh, which has not only a center for empirical legal research, they publish one of the most remarkable journal, which is called Journal of Empirical Legal Studies, JELS, Journal of Empirical Legal Studies. Now, this journal has become a sort of salma in advocating for uh, legal research. So, I think the platforms like these must train the students to develop the required degree of awareness as well as providing them with set of skills through which they can probably generate, explore and craft very crucial data which can be utilized to examine or critique the legal norm. Otherwise, what is happening in law school the students are made to convince rather than provoke about the reality of a legal norm. You cannot challenge the reality of a legal norm without having to show, without you know having the required data in your hand. And therefore, I insist that a skill development program like this, which must be talking about the research methodologies of various kinds, data collection techniques, data analysis tools, especially the basic softwares like Excel. I find not many law students are able to really make use of uh, uh, Excel software, which actually let you do a uh, lot of data analysis through its tool pack. And these tools are very important. So I think as a part of legal research method paper in undergraduate and postgraduate, the students are required to be necessarily asked to deal with the questions of data analysis, the questions of data collection.
the questions of writing empirical reports. Because I always say that more than any classroom lecture or training, it is important to allow the student to actually indulge in research. Because I always maintain the best way to learn research methodology is to do the research. Doing is the learning. Doing is not happening. The students are not venturing out of law schools to collect the data or to deal with the empirical questions. Now, last thing I would say that we are not very inquiring or inquisitive about various uh, questions or social realities uh, in the operation of law we have. So students are required to be taught about formulating very important queries which may require the collection of data because these queries will not be answered unless you have the data in your head. So to highlight the importance of data, we need to actually bring in a variety of uh, uh, mechanisms and law teaching methods in our classroom. And these methods should become the tool to teach legal research in the classroom setting. So students can be assigned certain data collection work under the guidance of teacher. And for teachers, it is important to really undergo some advanced legal research, you know, workshops. They should learn the things stepwise to be able to make use of those techniques in the classroom. It is the duty of the teachers to take legal research methods to the classroom situation. It is their duty to actually emphasize the role of legal research in critiquing the policy, in evaluating the legal question, in developing remarkable, insightful reports. And all these things would be hugely helped in case we shift our methodology or training from being very dull and pale to what I call critical. Critical methodology, critical thinking techniques, which is which which are capable of posing alternative questions. These things should be encouraged in the classroom situation, and doing that, I'm sure a lot of learning will take place. The good part and positive thing these days is that we have a good number of uh, uh, material resources, foreign and Indian books. Like in law, we always read Oxford Handbook. There is a Oxford Handbook on, on empirical legal research. There are some very, very insightful books which we have, uh, which, which have been published in the field of legal research. But I'm seeing somehow these resources are not put to enough use. That is the need. And these workshops should become a very important point are important as starter to increase the traditions of legal research, empiricism, objectivity. So these are some of my ideas and some of my thoughts. I'm sure these uh, I've been able to pinpoint certain things which might be useful to you. And I once again thank you and a lot for providing me this opportunity to speak before uh, this August audience. And I'm looking forward to be associated more and more in this kind of gatherings. Thank you one and all.